or this person had interest in dividends, so it's going to be here. Um, so we're going to kind of get into that nice um, A little bit of some admin <coughs> first. So I know like the top is like your name and the name of the person's spouse. Um, I guess, like, how many of you guys have done like by the end? Good. Good hand. Um, and just to suggest, like, people who've done it before, please, um, if you've seen other, like, Vita people who are kind of, like, I stuck, um, let these people, like, help, or help those people out. Because, like, I think a lot of, some of the rejects that we've received, it's not necessarily, like, these items, like, the wages not matching. Surprisingly, a lot of rejects have to do more about, like, social security numbers, the ITIN, um, not having all your paperwork. So we're gonna go with approaching, like okay, these things might not seem like a big deal, but they're very important to have um, when these taxpayers come. Um, and just as a little aside, like the first thing you do as a, a volunteer, like when you start greeting them and they start coming in, you don't want to prepare their tax return if they don't have their social security number or like their card and not the copy of the card. We actually want the real cards, right? Well, I don't know if, um, said, but when we did it before, we actually asked for the actual social. So never start a tax return or do the interview sheet without all their stuff. Um, I think if they are also married, both spouses have to be there to sign the tax return. So if they're like, no, no, like my spouse, he's not going to be here, but I can sign him. Like, no, uh, because it's you know required for both of them to sign. They both have to be present uh, when they're doing the tax return. Um, if not, like if they come in and they're like, well, we don't have all the items yet, and you know it's not the best time to do like the tax return by like, going back and then coming back here. Um, send them with the interview sheet. I think. Um, the IRS will give you guys like packets of all these forms, but pretty much the interview sheet is like this yellow sheet which lays out, um, it's like a questionnaire for the taxpayers, so once you uh, greet them, you have them fill it out, and let me see, do you remember the number of tax form? I have it all in my card, you want me to get it? Uh, <laughs> so you can try uh, form 3161, or you can just search up intake sheet. and then, um, you know, like, 
it's more beneficial for the parents. And I'm sure that they pay for like more than half their support and all that stuff. So they do have that right to claim. So if they, the dependent or the student is like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'm not paying myself, they can still um, file a tax return. Because some students will say, oh, I don't need to you know, file my taxes. I didn't make enough money. And that's probably you know, true. I think the threshold is 10500 or whatever that you're required to fill out a tax return. Mm -hmm. But just remind the students that, yeah, you might not need to, but withholdings. You withholdings, exactly. If you paid taxes to the government and your tax liability is zero, well, you know, that means you pretty much gave your money to the government and you're owed it back. Because what a tax refund essentially is, is like the excess of your payments, either through your withholdings, like from your W-2s, or for, you know, just as an aside for other clients, like if they made estimated tax payments throughout the year, like quarterly estimates, and then whatever your tax liability is at the bottom, if you've made more payments than you actually owe the government, that's your refund. Uh, but if the government's like, hey, we kind of made more money than you thought you would, your tax liability is like, for simplicity, say like 500, and you only paid like 300, then you have to pay that um, difference, right, that $200. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Make sure that they do ask for their parents beforehand if they're kind of unsure, because there is a box here that says, could you be claimed, could you not? Number 10. Number, what is it? Uh, oh, well, this one's a spouse, but like, <laughs> on, on this interview sheet? Um, I think it should be on the first page, but if you guys do <coughs> see it. students I would check number 10 a lot because even if they do say yes you kind of want to make sure okay if you are claiming yourself then yes we can get you the standard deduction or the exemption because if you are being claimed by your parent or another you know, person that exemption whatever is going to be decreased for dependents um, so that's what it is so kind of circling back when you do have the client come to you, the first thing you would do, besides asking if they have their SSN, like card, if they have their spouse, if they're married, um, what else, if they have like all their you know W-2s, their documents, <coughs> you would give them this interview sheet. So it's pretty basic, their names, all this stuff. Um, let's see. Make sure all of these boxes are checked. Um, if some of them are unsure, make sure you do circle back with the <coughs> tax you know, payer and say, okay, you know, um, say for scholarships, if they had like scholarships and they were kind of unsure if they were included in their 1098T, because the school is, uh, they issue this 1098T and you can use that on your tax return to claim like the American Opportunity Credit, or you can use that for like any of the other education benefits that you're allowed. Uh, so just make it. Yes. For the 1088, would you be paying on your tax return? Or would the parent be? If the parent claims it on the Good question. So it's going to be the parent if they claim you. Um, if it's you, I think there is actually, um, you don't, you're not able to claim it if you're like under 24 or whatever that is. There's like an age limitation. So you can't get it. So most likely most likely yes so that's the kind of things that you kind of want to put together if you're like okay this student is going to be by claimed by the parent and you see that they bring their 10 and 18 would probably probably be a good time to remind them like hey you know you are independent but just to make sure like make sure you provide this to your parents if they're a tax preparer can use this because what the big picture what the American Opportunity Credit does is on the second page of the 1040, uh, 
the tax credit is going to reduce your liability you know, dollar for dollar. Uh, do you guys kind of like know the, refi the, the difference yeah. between refundable and non-refundable credits? Mm -hmm. um, I can just kind of briefly go over it, but a credit versus you know an adjustment to your AGI, you have your tax liability of say $10 and you have um, a tax credit of $5. So effectively, you are reducing your tax liability dollar for dollar. So 10 minus five, you only owe $5 in tax, right? But if you're doing an adjustment to AGI, you're kind of just adjusting the taxable income portion. So you're not reducing your tax liability, you're reducing like the income portion of which your tax is based on, if that makes sense. So just big picture, credits are better, like in a sense that you reduce your tax liability. Um, so there are two kinds, refundable and non-refundable credits. Um, refundable credits are pretty much if you have this credit and it reduces your tax liability below zero, uh, say you had a tax liability of 200 and you have a credit of 500. So 200 minus 500, you have $300 of excess of that credit, right? So what the refundable credit does is you're able to get that as part of your, you can get that $300 back for you. So that's um, related to the American Opportunity Credit, I believe. 25% of that is refundable, like you get to have like $1,000 back, something like that. I mean, I won't go into like the number, gritty, de gritty nitty, whatever details, because I think when you're doing VITA, you'll always have your 4012 or your guides with you. I mean, I wouldn't want you like to memorize a lot of these things, but just big picture what these things are and what to spot, because like for me when I was doing VITA, like I didn't like to memorize stuff, like even the dependency stuff, I still kind of refer back. Always, always, always bring all those paper like, guides, um, notes and stuff, especially for foreign student. Like, I don't remember all the days and stuff that they had to be here half the year or something like that. But just know, like, big picture. Uh, because you can always, like, refer to these guides. There's, like, no shame in it. Because they, these numbers change every year. Um, like, the standard deduction will change. Um, so just knowing that big picture, like, the numbers will change. So I would just um, so that's the refundable credit. Non-refundable credit says, for using the same example, you have, what is that, the 500 credit, and then you have a $200 tax liability. You still have that $3, $300 of excess, but the government's like, well, this is a non-refundable credit. You don't get that credit back. It just, you just didn't get oh, That's what it is. There are a couple of credits that are not refundable, but I don't think they deal with a lot of those. But just knowing the difference, that's what those two are. Um, we were going off the 1098, right? So I know we went off with that. Um, any questions so far about that? Um, let's see. I think a lot of the forms that you'll see are 1098 T's in case students do are, are able to claim the credit students that are over 24 or 25, um, so they can do that. And we'll see W-2s, so if they worked, um, they're able to claim those like the holdings, pay taxes throughout the year for the W-2s. Unemployment compensation, 1099-G. Uh, quick question, if you guys know what you guys do. Are unemployment Compensation proceeds taxable, non taxable? The tax is taxable. Yeah, yeah it's taxable. Uh, essentially, like the government's saying, hey, you're not going to work, but you're getting employment, unemployment proceeds as if, you know, they're waiting. So they, those are taxable. Uh, yes. um, can you allow, when you get unemployment proceeds, can you elect to have? Uh, an amount taken out for tax, like, from, say, 
say it was like for your paycheck a certain amount taken out automatically? I believe or, you can. You can. Yeah. Okay. I think it's called you can elect to have withholdings come in and then have it count so, towards your payments. Do you know generally from what you've seen if people do that or if they end up having to pay a bunch of taxes? From what I did, I don't think I saw a lot of withholdings from the to clients that say like, hey, I have all my receipts, and you know, because I've had a bunch of people bring like boxes of receipts. I need to itemize my deductions. I have this and that, this and this and that. And I'm pretty sure, like, I want to say like over 90, 99% are gonna take the standard deduction. So if you have, just, just to save, you know, the headache and just to kind of let the taxpayer know if they bring a box of receipts, um, does anyone know what the standard deduction amount is this year? Six thousand three hundred. Six thousand three hundred. Sounds right. Yeah. Unless they own a home, they're not going to be yeah. able to itemize most likely. Exactly. So I would ask the client, you know, just lightly, you know, tell them like, hey, you know, do you think you, you know, paid more than six and three hundred throughout the year? And if not, then you know we benefit more from the standard deduction and exactly what you said like if they don't own a home if they don't pay you know real estate taxes or home mortgage interest or if they don't have a lot of unreimbursed medical expenses and remember that medical expenses are subject to the 10 percent agi deduction unless you're over like 60 something right, right. And most uh, people can't you can't do that most of the time either they cut that out right yeah yeah so um it's more beneficial that they would just Take the standard deduction. I don't really have. I don't think I've really seen a lot of itemized deductions. And if there were, it would be yeah, just related to a house. Um, but most of the time, 62, 63. That's what I would just tell them. You can just take the standard deduction. Don't need to get all fancy with the receipts. Yes. What is the head of household deduction? A head of household is a filing status. So. If they have like a dependent and they're like you know they're not married and they're like single, then they would benefit from that. They get a they get a higher uh, standard deduction, right? Yeah, the higher person is exactly what it's standard deduction is that what it is? I think so. I think so. Yeah, because there's different ones for like married, single, right, you're right. Yeah, there's there's like a a hierarchy from like the most advantageous <coughs> to the least advantageous filing status. I think the very top, of course, would be mar married filing currently, and married filing separately is like the lowest. I don't think we're even allowed to do married filing separately. If you do come across like a couple who's like, yeah, been separated from my spouse for legally, you know, separated, whatever, uh, then I would refer them to a professional tax worker. And that's one of the things that is very important about this interview sheet is that you'll catch a lot of these things, like things that might be either out of scope or they just have like say uh, something crazy like foreign tax credit that's like not within our means or royalty income or Schedule E stuff that is just, I don't know if you guys have seen a lot of those, but we would have returns and we're like halfway done or 100% done, or 75% done, and we find out, oh, this is like out of scope. Uh, because VITA, we're not allowed to do you know, returns that are not within like, our scope. And we would have like taxpayers kind of like pressured, I came all this way, you know, we did this tax return, can you just file it for me? And that's when you, did, you need to put your foot down and like say, no, you know, unfortunately, our site is not allowed to file these returns, but you know, I think we would print them sometimes just for them to kind of use as a reference. Even then, I think that's a little bit kind of like, I wouldn't do that. I would just shred it. Very important, by the way, to shred all these like materials that you make copies of, because you know, it's very important. Uh, just the confidentiality of your clients, and you know, you're holding a lot of 
sensitive information like your social security numbers and stuff like that. So I'm sure I can just again. Um, but yeah, like if you catch things on these forms that are like not within your scope, um, either bring it up to a vital coordinator, or coordinator, or just say like if you already know, refer them out. This might be applicable to Philip or, or Kyle as well, but will we have a reference guide for all the items that fall under out of scope? Mm -hmm. okay. It's on the book. I think, yeah, so can you maybe just bookmark some pages in your guides? Oh, what, what guide is it again? What's the number? 4012. Yeah, so mark those. As they are filling the interview sheet, <coughs> make sure you reference your 4012 and see whatever is out of scope kind of refer back to it and see like, okay, this might seem like one of these items. Uh, let's see. We can refer to <laughs> And then, how familiar are you guys about the like, health care you know, coverage and all of that stuff? your taxpayers should have you know, full year coverage. There are some exceptions. I won't go into too much detail, but it's, if some of them are like a non-resident alien, something like that, like it doesn't apply. Or if it was a short year, short few months gap, they have an exception. Um, but for the most part, they should have coverage, health insurance throughout the year. 